Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so thankful for the access that you've given us to come together in this fashion and feast upon your word, to glory in the truth of our position in you, all that you've done for us by grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. I just give you all the honor, the, gl the glory, and the praise. I ask that you would filter out that which is not of you, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, and truth only. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Um, we're going to continue on in our study in 1 John, but there's a... I want to take a few moments to just because we're closing out the, the, the new year, uh, I want to take a few moments to tell you something personal uh, that happened to me. I, I don't usually talk about myself. Uh, this is None of this is about me. But I do remember many years ago, I think it was about 33 years ago, 34 years ago, when I first came to know the Lord, I remember very distinctly uh, praying a very specific prayer, a very distinct prayer. I was, I was only a few days old in the Lord, and I remember praying that, asking God to, uh, telling God that I wanted to know him. Not a bunch of stuff about him, not just, you know, fill my head full of knowledge, uh, uh, historical facts and, and stuff about him, not just wanting to know about things about him, but I wanted to know him. And dearly beloved, I have never been able to put this book down since that day. I think it's important that we understand if we don't understand anything else, just how much a, a privilege it is to hold his word in our hand and to spend time in that book. Some of us spend more time in it than others. And the Lord has a purpose in each one of our lives for how he directs our steps. And I'm not, I have no desire to argue against that. It's not my intention to try to make anyone feel guilty. I just want you to know that it's one thing to possess, have, have in your possession to be given so much by God and know it. And it's quite another thing to be given so many blessings, to be blessed so abundantly, so richly in Christ Jesus and, and not know it. And the only way that we're going to know that is to spend time in this book. Another thing I want to mention here briefly in brief is, is just how many of you out there may think that I'm being redundant by talking about the same grace all the time or the, or the same blessings all the time or, 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 you know, really pushing home, you know, this, this whole concept of what I believe Christianity is, which is that we were born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. And we believe and we receive and we accept and we repent and we're perhaps we're baptized because Jesus Christ died in our place. It, we didn't do anything to be born again by God. That's why he chose birth to illustrate that, that fact. That's what separates me from much of modern evangelism. If you've followed us through these studies, you know that. Now, that doesn't make me right. And I have consistently, throughout the years, several years now, I've, I have taken every opportunity that I can to try to explain to you people how that I do not really care whether you believe me or not. I'm not trying to get you to believe what I believe. What I am trying to get you to do is to examine the scriptures to see if these things are so. I believe that I've spent many, 
many, many years of my life devoted to the study of God's word and, and in presenting the truth as I know it. But that doesn't make me right. It does, however, make me one who is very concerned about what I do, say, believe, and preach. So again, don't believe something just because I believe. And please don't feel like I'm being redundant all the time by talking about the same old thing all the time. And that Because that same old thing is really the gospel. And it is woven, interwoven throughout the text like a golden thread. You'll see it in every epistle. You'll see it in every chapter. You'll see it, practically see it in every verse where the, the focus, the spotlight is on Jesus Christ. It's not on us at all. And as we've studied through this amazing epistle, and we're almost uh, through it, uh, we're in the fifth chapter. We just begun in the fifth chapter. As we've studied through this, we've seen something very remarkable. And that is the Holy Spirit is really pushing that point home, stressing the point that by being born of God, we have a new sinless nature that cannot sin, and which is not me saying that we don't sin because we sin, because we have an old man. That's all that old man does is sin. What Scripture does is is make a distinction between those who were born of God, that new nature of that sinless seed, Jesus Christ, begotten of God. Do you, folks, do you honestly believe that God Almighty would, would begat or is able to give birth to or, or to produce offspring that is sinful? That's the question I want you to wrangle with because that is a most important question. Many people say that the new man, well, Steve, I, I know the text says that the new man cannot sin, but what it's really saying is it doesn't continue to sin, doesn't sin all the time. And of course, I've, I've talked about the good, Jesus talking about the good tree that brings forth good fruit, the, the bad tree brings forth bad fruit. And that illustrates that, that fact, and it helps drive that point home. So I don't really mean to sound redundant. Okay, but I feel compelled to camp out in this area of the word for a while, just a little while longer. Okay, these first few verses of chapter five, I believe they are that important. We have consistently throughout this book seen a distinctive, seen the Holy Spirit draw a distinctive difference between the old man and the new man, what some theologians would call the old nature, the new nature. I, I never, I never see it called nature in the scriptures, but you have put off the old man and put on the new man. It's not something that you need to do. The word says you've done that. Okay. The old man, which is corrupt, you've put on the new man that is created in righteousness and true holiness. You've done that. Okay. Now, depending where you are in your theology, if you're a Pentecostal, for example, or, or you're an Arminian, well, then you believe that that's something that you ought to do. You ought to put off the old man and you ought to put on the new man. Dearly beloved, the text says you've already done this. And in 1 John, we have a, a very classic example of the great conflict that exists between flesh and spirit, between the new man and the old man. The fact that you've uh, put off the old man and you've put on the new man does not mean that you have annihilated the old man, eradicated the old man. It doesn't mean that. And there is that constant conflict. Who, will, who shall deliver us from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. There's where reckoning comes in in Romans 6, 11. Now, verse four says, Who, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. I've spent some time on this. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. That's the faith of us, okay? It's a, it's a nominative. 
It's faith that belongs to us. We know that our faith is a gift from God. And in 2 Corinthians 1 24, it is in the, the faith that we stand. We stand in the area of faithfulness, which is Jesus Christ. And I believe it is scripturally impossible to separate your faith in Christ from Christ's faithfulness. That's a point I've tried to, to point out over this past year. Those are inseparable concepts. Whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. You don't overcome the world to be born of God. Now, if we go back to chapter 2, verse 23, whosoever denies the Son doesn't have the Father. Okay, he doesn't lose the Father by denying the Son. If he denies the Son, he doesn't have the Father. The reason he denies the Son is because he doesn't have the Father. The problem, dearly beloved, is that people turn it around. You know, if he denies the Son, he won't get the Father. Not what it says. He denies the Son because he doesn't have the Father. Verse 29 of chapter 2. Whoever, whosoever does righteousness is born of God. He doesn't become born of God by doing righteousness. How could someone who's not born of God do righteousness? Well, of course, he can't. And so you can't turn the text around. He does not become born of God a new creation in Christ because he does righteousness, okay? He does righteousness, and he does righteousness. He really does, whether he even knows it or not, because he's been born by God. If you don't do righteousness, folks, it's because you haven't been born by God. That's what we've seen in the text. Chapter 3, verse 4, Whosoever sins transgresses the law. Absolutely. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't possibly define sin without law. Where no law is, there's no sin. There's no transgression. I mean, how could Adam sin in the Garden of Eden? Well, he couldn't. All of a sudden, God said, don't eat. Now, he, now, he, now Adam can sin. It, it was God who created sin. If God had not said, don't eat, there wouldn't have been any sin, but God created sin when he said, don't eat. And I know I'm going to get in trouble for that. He's, he's not the author of sin, but he created sin, okay, by giving Adam the law. Adam sinned. So whatever, whatever sins, whoever sins transgresses the law. Of course, sin is transgression of the law. Verse 6, whosoever is born of God sins not. Chapter 3, verse 6, whosoever abides in him doesn't sin. Whosoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. Okay? Folks, you don't neither see him or know him by sinning. Okay? You sin because you've neither seen him nor known him. The one who abides in him sins not. And every single last one of you out there sins. And so you say, well, well wait a minute, I, I got a verse that says, if we say we have no sin, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us, and yet here's a text that says, whosoever abideth in him does not sin, doesn't have the power, doesn't have the ability to sin. And that's where we had the problem of separating the new man and the old man. If the new man can sin, well, we're in trouble. You know, what does it mean, folks, to be created in righteousness and true holiness if the new man can sin? If the new man can sin, what's heaven going to be like? New creations in heaven who can still sin? That's really not my idea of heaven. Clearly, the one who abides in him sins not. But we need to know more than that. So we get down to verse 9. All who were born of God do not commit sin, and now we have well, prominent theologians saying, now, wow, now, now, apparently, I, I mean, I've got, I, I've got myself a problem here because I know I sinned, therefore I must not be born of God. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin for his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. And now the Greek professor 
Well, he, he kind of scratches his head and he says, oh, well, wait a minute. It's in the present tense. I got, I, I got no problem. Whosoever is born of God, that what that says is whosoever, what that really says is whosoever is born of God does not continue to sin for his seed abides in him and he has no ability to keep on, keep on sinning. Well, what are you saying, Greek professor? Are you saying, well, since he has no ability to keep on sinning, eventually he'll reach the point where that he doesn't uh, sin anymore? Now, I can give you now. I, 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 I decided I was not going to throw names out across this channel, but I can give you the names of several ministers I know who believe that. That's what the verse says. All of you who are born of God, you know, working at it, you'll get to the point where that you no longer sin. I do not believe that. And I, I don't think that many of you do either. In Luke 7, the Lord Jesus Christ says a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Makes good common sense. And an evil tree can't bring forth good fruit. Okay. Now, I agree with that, but, but well, you know, I, I, well, I agree with that, says the Greek professor, you know, but wait a minute, you know, those are present tenses, therefore, well, now, wait a minute. Oh, those are present tenses there. So what it's saying is a good tree doesn't bring forth evil fruit all the time. Is that what that's saying? Some of it's got to be good, but, you know, and a good tree does not bring forth good fruit all the time. You know, a bad tree doesn't bring forth bad fruit all the time. Uh, folks, do you think that that's what Christ was saying? Christ was clearly, dogmatically declaring that a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Can't do it. It's got to be an evil tree that, that does that, that brings forth evil fruit. That's what the Holy Spirit is saying here in our study in 1 John. Can you imagine being an offspring of God and still being able to sin? And, and I'm not suggesting in any way that your old man doesn't sin. Of course it does. But can you possibly imagine that, you know, that being God's offspring, God's seed, that God could bring forth evil fruit? Folks, is that what you believe? You know, God's seed is sinless. It doesn't have the ability to sin. Chapter 3, verse 9. He doesn't have the ability to commit sin. It doesn't say that if... It, and it does not say that if you confess Jesus is the Son of God, then God will dwell in you. doesn't say that. doesn't say that. It clearly says that if God dwells in you, then you confess that Jesus is the Son of God. We have reversed it, folks. Almost everything. And I think that's partly due to the times we're living. It's, it's, not the, it's the result of the sovereign action of our loving Heavenly Father. If you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, it is because God dwells in you. God doesn't dwell in you because you did anything. You're not born because you repent. You are not born again from above by God, by the will of God, because you confessed. You're not born because you accepted you're born from above by God's will because you're his child. In chapter 5, if you believe Jesus is the Christ, you'll be born of God. Doesn't say that. Again, it's, it's, I pointed this out. It's a perfect passive. I believe that you were born of God before the foundation of the world. That's what we saw in previous studies. Very few people, folks, believe that. You were dead in sin. He made you alive in Christ. People throw that verse at me, and, 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 and rightly so. You know, if that verse says to you, you know, see, I was dead, headed for hell, and God made me alive. Uh, you know, that you was headed for hell, and God, you know, made you alive all of a sudden. If, if that's the way that you take that verse, I think you'd have problems with many, many other passages of Scripture. Okay, I, I, I pointed out the prodigal son. Great lesson there in that. When was he a son? Well, when he was born. I don't think the prodigal son was ever headed for hell. I do think he was dead, but I don't think that means that he was no longer the father's son. 
and I pointed this out as well, the fact that there are people in this world who are God's children by God's elective decree and born from above by the word, by the will of God, does not mean that they're headed for hell if they don't know that. I do agree that they are dead in sin, but that doesn't mean that they're headed for hell. Very, very seldom does the word death in the scriptures, which means separation, by the way. That's what the word death means. Very rarely does that mean hell. Well, except of almost all modern Christians, it seems. Chapter 5, verse 4. Whosoever has been born by God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even the faith in which we dwell. Okay, which I believe to be our faith in Christ, our faith in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It's not our faith in our ourselves. It's our faith in the faithfulness of Christ. So we, we are in that context, awake to that understanding. But it does not say if he overcomes the world, he's born of God. It doesn't say that. Clearly, clearly, folks, the text says the one that overcomes the world does so because he's been born by God. What is our faith? What that verse says is that the way we overcome the world is by trusting in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, and that's what we do. We don't overcome the world by our fighting or by anything that we do. We overcome the world because we've been born of God, and we believe that. Now, not, not everyone believes that, but it still means they've still overcome the world, even though they're living in the world, which I'm going to get to here. We're going to go back and look at Colossians chapter 2. It says we do overcome the world because we've been born by God. It doesn't say that if we overcome the world, we'll be born of God. It doesn't say that. And we are resting in our faith, which is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Our faith, folks, is to rest in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand what the Holy Spirit here means by world. The word world, I've done, I've spoken about this in a number of videos this, just this past year. The world system is a system that hates you. It hates you. The world system is a system of religious effort that hates you. The world system is a religious system based on the idea of human merit, human performance. Therefore, it hates you, okay? Because it thinks you don't have to do it. You're saying that we don't have to do anything. And if you're involved in the religious world system, you will put God's people out of the synagogue thinking that you do God's service. I believe the world system is a system of man's efforts to please God, to go to heaven, to redeem himself by works, by human works, by human effort. I don't think overcoming the world means victory against oh, well, yeah, communism, oh, an invasion of Muslims or, or something like that. Overcoming the world system is not overcoming bars, okay, you know, or, or you know, whatever your vice is. Whatever is, is that old man, wretched old man of yours is trying to live up to, it's it's trying to live in such a way as to please God and by that gain merit. And I'm not saying, please, I'm not saying you shouldn't live in order to please God. But you don't do that in order to gain merit, to do things in order to be blessed by God. Folks, you've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. That's what the text says, and that ought to have, have that ought to really cause you to stop dead in your tracks and think about this for a moment. And I believe we've overcome that system of human effort. We've overcome that system, that world religious system, because and because only we've been born of God. You're not going to heaven because of anything that you do. You can turn on the TV. You can get a thousand evangelistic messages that will assure you that the only way you can go to heaven is by something that you do. You go to heaven, folks, because he died in your place. Not because you accept. You, you go to heaven because 
You don't go to heaven because you believe. You don't go to heaven because you accept. You go to heaven be because you're born of God. You're his child. Okay? He chose you in him before the foundation of the world. Overcoming that world system is a marvelous thing. It's, it, it's not my works. It's his. It's the work of Christ, the finished work of Christ. It's not my effort. It's his. It's not my goodness. It's his. In Matthew 25, many will say unto him in that day, have we not done many wonderful works in your name? Please, folks, don't plan on saying that. Okay? I trust that I'm going to say, Lord, I trusted you. I rested in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, there might be many other applications of overcoming the world, but to me, to overcome the world religious system based on human merit, that submission to legalism, that human works, all of that garbage, okay? I mean, folks, you should have perfect peace and rest and joy. That's what God wants you to have. If you really believe God is working in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure, what else do you want? What else do you want? I don't care where you are or what your situation that you're in. Why would you want anything else if God's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure? And that's what he's doing in the lives of every one of you. Every one of you. Without exception. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. And very few Christians have minds who have perfect peace. I don't, I don't care if God wants me sick. That's fine. If he wants me in heaven, that's fine. If he wants me in difficulty, that's fine. I never am concerned about that. His way is the way I want. That's the way I want. The world system is personal blame. Something happened. You know, we have a tragedy. I, I don't see how there can be any tragedies in a Christian's life. There, now, there can be things that are horrible from a human standpoint. I'll agree. I'll admit that. But to know that your life is hid with Christ in God, that he knows the way that you take when he's tested you, you shall come forth as gold, that he lights your candle, that he bottles your tears. Dearly beloved, God has declared that he's working in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. It, did he lie or did he not? And on top of that, he's declared that he will never, never cease to sustain you and to uphold you. That's our God. Some of you might remember our study through Colossians. So I'd like to read through Colossians chapter 2, if you don't mind. I, I, I want to, I think this needs to, it fits nicely into the end of this video. You know, and maybe highlight parts of that marvelous chapter. You know, thinking about how it relates to the subject of our having overcome this world religious system based on human merit. Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, stop folks, think, how did you receive him? So walk ye in him, in the same way, that's by grace. How did you receive him? By grace. How do you walk in him? By grace. Because of something you did? Is that because of something that you did? No. 
rooted and built up in him and, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head, okay, of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, identification, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us. Oh, how they are contrary to us. And took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And here we go. Listen, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not listen, and not holding the head, dearly beloved, from which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, and you are, since you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Dearly beloved, if you are a Christian, born of God, living in that world religious system based on human merit, you need to know that that does not mean you have not overcome the world, but that you are involved in a world system, a world theological system, which you have overcome. You're in the wrong place, theologically speaking. I'm not saying throw away all your friends but you're in the wrong place theologically, a place that wasn't designated as a place where you are to abide, to reside. Like, like the prodigal son, you're living off in the far country as your father's son. Don't you see the grace, folks? Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope all of you are well. I hope all of you had a, a, a wonderful Christmas. I'm looking forward to entering into the new year in 2022. I'll have something to say about that here in the next video or two. Until then, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.